Okay. Well, um, they're talking about this book, Red Water. It was published in 1920. Um, The truth is, there's like too many important things in this book for me to talk about. I mean, even just in the part I assigned you to read, there's too much. Uh, um, in, in particular, I'm not going to get into the details of the part of the reading. So there's this essay um, called The Ruling of Men. Um, which is where um, Du Bois develops, a, like properly speaking, like political philosophy of democracy. Um, and um, and it ends up for, with <clears throat> strong arguments for specific things. Number one, socialism, or what he calls industrial democracy. And number two, what I guess nowadays is sometimes called consociational democracy, but the idea being that, that as he puts it, um, the majority can't make decisions without bringing the minority into council. <laughs> um, I mean, as far as that goes, like I'm not sure exactly what institutional arrangements, if any, he has in mind for that, but he thinks that that's the proper development of democracy in the future, um, like I said, I'm not going to get to, to really talk about the details of what he says there, um, but it's still, I think, an important thing to assign. I mean, for one thing, as I said last time, I'm not sure how much Du Bois's uh, like personal views on this actually changed, but he definitely was more outspokenly uh, an advocate of socialism. When he got more there, so um, it's important to see that. Um, and there's other important things in this text. Um, I mean, for one thing, like if I did talk about it more, I could talk more about the relationship between him and him and James Adams because he's uh, um, comes pretty close to her here. For example, on like what's meant by the phrase "consent of the governed." Um, Right, he says that he says this is several times, but here's several times different versions of this. But here's one place he says this is on page 140 in the um, text I linked to on the syllabus. Um, Um, right, that the, 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 the reason for democracy is um, the rejection of this old assumption, the old assumption that there are those in the world who know better what is best for others than those others know themselves and who can be trusted to do this best. In fact, no one knows himself but that self's own soul. Right, so like consent of the governed means we have to get like everyone's experience. We need their input um, to make the right decision. No one can make it for them. Um, um, so, um, well, like I said, I. I could talk a lot about how that's the same or different from, from Adams's view, but I'm not going to. Um, you know, also it would be really interesting to compare what he says in that essay to what Declare says, and for that matter, to what Jonathan Edwards says. Um, um, you know, like he starts off by saying, this is the very beginning, the ruling of men is the effort to direct the individual actions of many persons towards some end. 
this end theoretically should be the greatest good of all. So, you know, I mean, that suggests something about why it has this kind of awkward title. Now, I mean, you know, he definitely likes the sound of certain phrases. <laughs> um, um, you know, like in, I think it's more um, apparent in the Souls of Black Folk than it is in this book, maybe. That, like, he talked, like, he, like, several times he says that in the Souls of Black Folk, he says that something was, quote, a government of men. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, so like he likes that, but I think it's more than just, and you know, he is a poet among other things. So he, I mean, I think he does definitely sometimes put words in because for like poetical reasons, whatever those are, <laughs> I don't really understand. I'm not a poet, um, but, uh, um, but in this case, I think there's something, you know, like if I were to compare him in detail to declare, I would ask, like, why I think he he wants to emphasize that government or uh, ruling is a like it's derived from a verb, right? That it's like governing or ruling someone now. Um, you know, another thing that I, by the way, that I could have assigned in here and the, um, and well, like many other things, it would have been great to read, but I didn't have room for it, is this uh, piece called The Damnation of Women, which is a very like strongly feminist essay, right? So, I mean, he's, you know, but like we already saw how people like declare, you know, who, the other thing we could have read by Declare was her was like her writings proving that uh, marriage as it exists now is a form is basically sexual slavery, <laughs> right? Like so she was, uh, you know, but but nevertheless she also does this thing, right? Or men that you know, I mean, anyway. But so it's the ruling of someone, and I feel like the in part that's an attempt to ward off or or argue against or something, you know, that the thing that Declare says is inevitable, namely that government will come to be uh a noun, like a name for a certain entity that has its own interests. And those interests won't be the same as us, right? And that's why Declare says that no government could be a good idea ever. Um, so, you know, instead he wants to talk about governing. Um, that, I mean, that's that's not an argument or anything. That's just an indication of where his thought might, like where he might diverge from Declare. Anyway, that's, that, that, that's, uh, that was a very long not saying anything about something. <laughs> Uh, are, are there questions about that before I go on to talk about other things? Like, yeah. Right, because, you know, but, so what I do want to talk about is that basically this book um, is a response to World War I. I don't know why I'm writing it. All right, um, which of course he doesn't call World War One because there's only been one so far, so he just calls it the World War, right? Um, and uh, um, and it's you know it's basically about that from beginning to end. Although sometimes it's more explicit and sometimes it's less explicit, um, and. Um, why is it about that? Well, I mean, so first of all, of course, that was some kind of turning point in the relationship between America and Europe. Um, I mean, you know, of course, the relationship between America and Europe is kind of a theme that's run through most of these authors. Uh, I haven't talked about it systematically. Uh, it's I'm thinking it's going to be one of the 
suggested paper topics for the rental paper, <laughs> something about that, <laughs> um, uh, to get you to try to do my thinking for me. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, so there's, there's some kind of turning point in the relationship between Europe and America, um, especially between America and France, obviously. Um, and, um, but there's two ways to look at it and like what happens here. So one way to look at it is like, so re remember that France was America's ally in the revolution. So one way to look at it is like America is now mature enough to return the favor, right? Like now America is secure in its freedom at home and is ready to go defend it in France where it's under attack. Um, and supposedly General Pershing, when he landed in France, or I saw different versions of this. Also, some people say it wasn't him, but someone else on his staff. But anyway, when he landed in France or when he arrived in Paris, he said, Lafayette, we have returned. Right, you know, Lafayette, yeah, okay. So, um, um, so that's this way of thinking about it. And Du Bois sometimes thinks about it that way. Right, so like towards the end of the book, in the essay called Of Beauty and Death, so this is on page 243. Um, the first thing he, so he's describing his return from Europe after the war. And the first thing he mentioned, he sees, he says, New York, behind the liberty that faces free, free France rise the white cliffs of Manhattan, right? There he's thinking about, you know, um, exactly what I'm talking about, like the liberty that, that France, helped us gain, and, you know, the Statue of Liberty is facing France, and now France is free because we defend it. Um, now, I mean, for one thing, I could say, uh, um, that's obviously very unlike what de Clare would say about this, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, like us having raised an army and invaded another country, how well does that conform to American tradition? And she would say that that's just a sign of how these traditions can't be maintained um, because they really, and no government is consistent with them. But um, so Du Bois is not at this point thinking about it that way. Um, on the other hand, here's something else he says about it in the, the Souls of White Folk, which is probably the most important and certainly the most, well, I shouldn't say. I think of beauty and death is also very important and striking, and they're very different. <laughs> And they're almost at the opposite ends of the book. I mean, there's some stuff before the soul of white folk, but they're almost at the opposite ends of the book. And anyway, here's what he says in the soul of white folk on page 51. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm saying the page, I'm, yeah, why should you care? I'm not saying the page number is in my edition. I'm saying the page number is in the edition. Okay, um, so, um, So, you know, talking sarcastically about America, a land of democracy, he says, absolutely without excuse, he established a caste system, rushed into preparation for war, and conquered tropical colonies. Right? So he's talking about like the Philippines and Cuba, I guess. He stands today shoulder to shoulder with Europe in Europe's worst sin against civilization. Right, so here, the, and this is more like what de Clare would say, here, America's return to Europe is a sign that uh, 
it has abandoned its American principles if it have ever had any, and it's prepared to take its place next to Europe. Okay, so I mean, I, you know, so th there's definitely some kind of tension, but I mean, it's not like an unnoticed tension or something. I mean, I think of beauty and death is, is essentially about this tension. <laughs> But there's definitely some kind of tension between one way of, look, of looking at what's going on in the war and America's participation in the war and another way of looking at it. Now, I mean, so uh, just uh, to fill in the background here, Du Bois himself didn't serve in the war, but he came close to serving in the war. And the, like the way he came close is, um, is revealing. So this is a summary. This is from a Wikipedia article. It's sourced to the biography of Du Bois by David L. Lewis, um, which um, I probably, if I had time, would have looked at to see what his sources are. <laughs> um, but in any case, right, because this is this is like these. Uh, it makes a big difference how, how sure we are about some of the things he, he's about to say. But so here's here's what, I mean, Wikipedia says, citing him. NAACP chairman Joel Springarn. Joel Springarn was white. He was the chairman of the NAACP. He was also a somewhat famous literary critic. Anyway, so NAACP chairman Joel Springarn was enthusiastic about the war. And he persuaded Du Bois to consider an officer's commission in the army, contingent on Du Bois writing an editorial repudiating his anti-war stance. Right. So before that, Du Bois had said some things against the war, some things that sound a lot like souls of black folk. I mean, sorry, souls of white folk. And in fact, in fact, souls of white folk is, folk is partly based on some stuff that he published in 1915. So, um, but so in any case. Um, so Joel Springarn is convincing him to uh, consider a commission in the army, and he's saying, but of course, in order to do that, you'll have to write an editorial retracting your anti-war stance. Du Bois accepted this bargain and wrote the pro-war close ranks editorial in June 1918, and soon thereafter, he received a commission in the army. Many black leaders who wanted to leverage the war to gain civil rights for African Americans criticized Du Bois for his sudden reversal. And then, this is kind of the punchline, Southern officers in Du Bois's unit objected to his presence and his commission was withdrawn. <laughs> so, right, so he went through this whole thing, and very controversial, wrote this editorial, and but then actually he wasn't allowed to serve in the end anyway. Um, but he did travel to Europe in 1919 at the end of the war. And he was, he was there both to study the experiences of black soldiers. Um, I, I, um, I guess he was planning to write a study of that, but I, I don't think he ever wrote that. But anyway, he was there to study the experiences of black soldiers and to attend the first Pan-African Congress. Um, Okay, so that's why in A Beauty uh, and Death at the end of the book, he's, he describes being in Europe at the end of the war. He didn't, he didn't serve in the war, but he was there when the war ended. Um, now, okay, so here is the, I, here's this editorial, Close Ranks. It's very short, so I'm gonna read it to you in full. It appeared in the crisis in July, 1918. This is the crisis of the world. For all the long years to come, men will point to the year 1918 as the great day of decision. That is the day when the world decided whether we would submit to military despotism and an endless armed peace, if peace it could be called, or whether they would put down the menace of German militarism and inaugurate the United States of the world. We of the colored race have no ordinary interest in the outcome. That which the German power represents today spells death to the aspirations of Negroes and all darker races for equality, freedom, and democracy. Let us not hesitate. 
Let us, while this war lasts, forget our own special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. So that's what he wrote in July of 1918. Um, so could that possibly be consistent with, well, I mean, two things, two, there's, there's two different things that, you know, the beginning of this book that seem completely inconsistent with that. Um, one is what he writes very near the beginning in the um, part called Credo. Credo, you can ask that. Um, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is on page four. I believe that war is murder. I believe that armies and navies are at bottom the tinsel and braggadocio of oppression and wrong. And I believe that the wicked conquest of weaker and darker nations by nations whiter and stronger but foreshadows the death of that strength. Right? So there's not like an anti war, like a broad anti war statement. But then, moreover, there's in the Souls of White Up quote, he says a lot of things about why there was a world war. And he says that it wasn't to defend democracy against military. Um, um, right? He says that it was it was basically a squabble over who would get like colonial possessions. Um, and he also says more specifically that it's ridiculous to think that America entered this war as a defender of democracy. Right? So this is like this is on page 50 in Souls of White Boat. It is curious to see America, the United States, looking on herself first as a sort of natural peacemaker then as a moral protagonist in this terrible time. No nation is less fitted for this role. Um, right, for two or more centuries, I don't know what time he's counting from, but for two or more centuries, 1718, I don't know. But anyway, for two or more centuries, uh, America has marched proudly in the van of human hatred. Um, um, and here, so here's something that's a little bit higher up on the same page, or no farther down on the same page. Instead of standing as a great example of the success of democracy and the possibility of human brotherhood, America has taken her place as an awful example of its pitfalls and failures. Right? So, um, number one, again, that seems to be in Complete, a complete contradiction to what he said in that editorial, Close Ranks. But it also seems to be maybe not a complete contradiction because after all, the thing I read about the Statue of Liberty, it didn't really assert anything, right? It just said that he saw the, the Statue of Liberty facing free Franks, but, uh, but it implies a uh, attitude, you know, diametrically opposed to these things. Um, so, okay, so there's, you know, um, so again, and I think I said this last time that just as we saw Du Bois being of two minds in Souls of Black Folk, here too, he's of two minds. Um, I mean, 
I guess if we're only that editorial, of course, there's two things you could say, or maybe you could say both of them. One is you could say, well, Du Bois was never sincere in his pro war stance. Um, now, like for for that, that's why I wish wish I had seen that biography and like what the sources are, for, like how much we know about what on, went on between Joel Springer and, and Du Bois about this. But uh, in other words, is there actually a letter where he says like, okay, I'll write that editorial if you can get me a commission, or is this or is this kind of inference? But I mean, so yeah, you could say he wasn't sincere. I mean. That would be a little bit damning, though, because I mean, so like it would be one thing to say, okay, he wrote this pro war editorial to get, I don't know, like support for the NAACP or something like that. So you could say, well, maybe, you know, that was necessary. But he, but no, he wrote it to get an officer's commission in the army. So <laughs> right? he wanted to be in the army. <laughs> um, so, uh, but anyway, that's one thing you could say. Another thing you could say is, well, Du Bois has completely changed his mind between 1918 and 1920. Now, I mean, um, that wouldn't be outlandish at all. First of all, given his own experience, Right, his commission was withdrawn because Southern officers objected to it. Um, that seems like it might be enough to change anyone's mind. Um, and also, uh, you know, the experience of other Black officers and enlisted men before and during the war, which he he describes some of that in of beauty and death. Um, but not all of it. I guess, um, you know, it turned out that most of the black soldiers who were sent over there were used as laborers. Um, there were some units that, that were in combat and, you know, like the 92nd Infantry, which is who he's hanging out with at the end in of Beauty and Death. Um, but, you know, the, the whole experience was not Right. Um, so, like, um, um, so maybe those experiences you could say changed his mind between 1918 and 1920. Or maybe he found out more things about Germany, or I mean, he must have known about Belgium and the Congo, though, before 1918. I don't think that that was so, like suddenly discovered, isn't it? right? I mean, because that's that's something he refers to in the Soul of the White Book. For, like part of the you know excuse for um, or excuse or part of the cause for going into the war was the German atrocities in Belgium. Um, and you know, in the Soul of the White Book, Du Bois says, "Well, you know, okay, maybe Germany committed." atrocities in Belgium, but it's nothing like the atrocities that Belgium committed in the Congo. <laughs> um, which is, I, I mean, I think it's is true. I don't I don't even know, I don't know at this point how much people think the alleged German atrocities in World War One, whether that was even that, that was kind of like exaggerated and trumped up or not. I'm, I'm not sure. I feel like at least people thought so after the war, and that that's part of the reason when the Germans really started committing atrocities in World War II, a lot of people didn't believe it. <laughs> um, but in any case, be that as it may, so something in between may have learned, may have changed his mind. Um, but um, it would be difficult to. Um, Reconcile either of those explanations with the things he says in *Of Beauty of Death* and, and *Death* in the in the book he actually published in 1920. Um, and like for one thing, just before he describes the series of insults and so forth that that were involved in blacks trying to serve in the army in the war. Um, He says, so this is after one of his like rhapsodic descriptions of nature. 
right? This, the, the, of beauty and depth kind of alternates these descriptions of nature or of, not necessarily just of nature, because sometimes it's cities, there's like human landscapes too, but it's it's something like the beauties of nature and then it alternates with these um, mostly descriptions of the effects of race prejudice. Um, so anyway, so right after this description of Montego Bay in Jamaica, he says, from such heights of holiness, men turn to master the world. All the pettiness of life drops away and it becomes a great battle before the Lord. His trumpet, where does it sound and wither? I go. I saw Montego Bay at the beginning of, of the World War. The cry for service as high as heaven, as wide as human feelings, seemed filling the earth. What were petty slights, silly insults, paltry problems beside this call to do and dare and die? Um, I don't know, by the way, whether I couldn't figure out whether his being in Montego Bay was somehow connected to the beginning of the war. I don't think so. I couldn't find any way to connect them. I think that's just where he was when well, the war started or something like that. I don't know. But um, but in any case, right, so that, I mean, I guess, you know, you could still say, well, that's, he's, he's kind of like channeling what he thought at the time in 1918. Um, uh, or 1914, or? Yeah, what does he mean by the beginning of the World War? Of course, America didn't enter at the beginning of it. Um, well, anyway, so uh, maybe he's just kind of compressing things there, right? That there wasn't a call for Americans to serve in the war at the beginning of the war. Um, but anyway, but he goes on to say, I think more directly, this is on page 241. Um, Here was France beaten to her knees, yet fighting as never nation fought before, calling in her death agony across the seas till her help came, and with all its strut and careless braggadocio, there's that word again, but now it's something good apparently. Save the worthiest nation of the world from the wickedest fate ever plotted by fools for the capital F. Right? So, like now in, in the souls of white folk, France is like, I think the, the phrase he uses is like France and England were like gnawing on their bones and meaning like, like, um, like crouching over their colonial possessions and, you know, and Germany is screaming at the leash, wanting to, to get them away, right? Um, and uh, so, and, but now here all, all of a sudden, France is the worthiest nation in the world and um, America has come to save them from the wickedest fate ever plotted by fools. Um, And then finally, there's this, which um, comes right actually before the passage I was reading. It's on page 240. Um, this long passage that starts, my God, for what am I thankful this night? For nothing, for nothing but the most commonplace of commonplaces. A table of gentlewomen and gentlemen, soft-spoken, sweet-tempered, full of human sympathy, who made me a stranger, one of them. Ours is a fellowship of common books, common knowledge, mighty aims. We could laugh and joke and think as friends, and the thing, the hateful, murderous, dirty thing, which in America, which in American we call N-word hatred, <laughs> was not only not there, it could not even be understood. It was a curious monstrosity at which civilized folk laughed or looked puzzled. Um, 
There was no elegant and elaborate condescension of, we once had a colored servant. My father was an abolitionist. I've always been, been interested in your people. There was only the community of kindred souls, da 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 da. Right? So this is, this is, I mean, it's the same thing that in Souls of Black Folk, he, he like alluded to at the beginning where he said that, you know, um, he's always had the experience of being a problem, except perhaps in babyhood and in Europe, right? So he's saying the same thing here, but now he's saying it after all the things he wrote in Souls of White Folk, he comes back to it. I mean, of course, I don't know in what order these things were actually written. I think, you know, I mean, you could determine something about that because a lot of them did appear in other places first. In, in some form, at least, right? So you could find all the original forms, see what their sequence was, see what you may have changed when you put them in the book and whatever. But I think the point is, uh, like, this doesn't feel, it's, this isn't a book that he just like threw together with whatever he had in the drawer, <laughs> right? It's like very carefully arranged. Um, so, uh, I think whatever he says here is something he still wants to say in 1920. Um, and it ends with this. Um, this was Paris in the years of salvation, 1919. Fellow Blacks, we must join the democracy of Europe. So there's actually, I guess there's kind of like, three or maybe four different inconsistent positions here, right? I mean, one is this war shows that America is just as bad as Europe. Um, another is this war is shows that America is now able to return the favor to France and, you know, and protect France's freedom. Um, uh, just as France protected our freedom. Um, another is um, traveling to Europe at the end of this war, I realized how um, the real home of democracy is Europe. <laughs> um, like, um, and they saying all three of these in the same book. So I think, you know, I mean, I can't claim to that I can solve all the problems about this. Um, um, but I think um, somehow the it seems like the doubling here is related to two different points of view. Now I don't know if I don't think these are the same as the two different points of view I was talking about last time, but I'm not sure. Maybe they are the same somehow. Um, but um, Du Bois describes the war, so to speak, from two different places. Um, you know, from inside America and from outside America. Um, And I think Souls of White Folk is written from inside America, whereas On Beauty and Death is written, or Of Beauty and Death, sorry, is written from outside America, right? It's, I mean, so like I said, I don't, I don't know a specific reason he was in Jamaica at the beginning of the war, but that's where, that's how he starts his description of it. I was in Jamaica and, um, and, uh, and at the end, um, of course, he's in France. Um, although I have to add, um, in both cases, he's kind of removed from the scene. I, not in exactly the same way, but so, you know, the beginning of The Souls of White Folk, this is page 29, the beginning of the Souls of White Folk is, high in the tower where I sit above the loud complaining of the human sea, 
I know many souls that toss and whirl and pass, but none that there are that intrigue me more than the souls of white folk. Right, so he's sitting up in a tower. Now, obviously, this is a figurative tower, right? I mean, he's not actually in a tower, but he's sitting up in a tower, and these like waters are rushing past. So, it, somehow, I feel like the title of the book, "Dark Water," is, must be related to that image, but I don't, I don't know exactly. What it means. I don't know more than that about about what the title means. But so that's the souls of white folk. And then in Of Beauty and Death, at the end of the war, he's um, again, he's in a literal tower, or at least an upstairs window. It's probably not really a tower, but he's up in a window. This is the bottom of page 241. Um, Up in the window stood a black major, a captain, a teacher, and I, with tears behind our smiling eyes. Tim Brim was paying by the town pump. Um, Tim Brim had to, wasn't that easy to figure out who this was because well, Du Bois spells it this way. It's actually spelled this way. But he was a jazz band leader who uh, um, became the leader of the regimental band of the uh, 300 and something artillery division. 300 and 50th. Field Artillery uh, Regiment called Black Devils. <laughs> right. So he was, you know, uh, and now at the end of the war, they're in this small, uh, like, village in um, northeastern France, and Tim Brim and his, like, musicians are playing jazz in the, in the, by the town pump. So, um, and, he, but, and he's watching from upstairs. Um, so, I mean, that, that distance or height must itself be, I feel like that must itself, I mean, well, okay, put it this way. It's clear that in the souls of white folk, that's somehow important. Right, because like he's, you know, it's it's not literal. He introduces it specifically as an image, and it's the beginning and the end of the essay. But I I feel like that height or distance popping up there again in um, a beauty and death that that somehow that's continuing that motif. However, I'm not sure um, exactly what to make of it. Um, I mean, it's it seems to be a um, it seems to be a personal expression of Du Bois's nature that he's not. Um, I mean, another thing that he says says in the postscript to this book, which is printed at the beginning, he says. Uh, I was in the world, but not of it. Um, I mean, you could interpret that to mean that because he was in the world within the veil, but I think maybe he means that more generally, right? That like he's um, um, he's always a little bit of an outsider, you know, he goes. Um, If that's all it means, it might not be that relevant to what I, other things I want to say about this book, but on the other hand, maybe it is. Anyway, I just wanted to call attention to it, even if I don't know what to say about it. But um, um, but the other thing about like um,
The other thing about looking from outside of America and inside the America, I think is um, is definitely, well, definitely. I feel like it's significant. And so like when he when he does get back to New York, like I said, the first thing he mentions is the um, the Statue of Liberty facing France. And then there's several paragraphs of like again, this kind of ecstatic description of New York, the skyline of Harlem, whatever. And then this is on near the top of two, page 246. There's suddenly the paragraph that starts, and then the veil. It drops as drops the night on southern seas, vast, sudden, unanswering. Right? Like this outside pers this outside perspective um, from which America looks um, beautiful and brave and like a defender of liberty um, lasts long enough for him to see New York that way. And then all of a sudden, boom, the veil drops down again. That's the end of it. Um, I mean, he doesn't like, he doesn't describe any particular thing happening at that point. I, and I mean, I guess it's possible that some particular thing happened, but it, but he doesn't mention it's right. It just seems to be um, this vast, sudden, unanswering. It's just like a sudden change of perspective. All of a sudden, it's there again. Um, so it's. Um, Um, with that veil in place, he can't see America in any of those ways. And he can't see Europe. I think, and I think like that's perhaps the difference between in, in his attitude towards his earlier attitude towards Europe and his attitude towards Europe in this book. Because the earlier attitude is still there, right? Like when he's he calls France the worthiest nation in the world, right? The earlier attitude is still there. So I mean, part of his like um, fight with Booker T. Washington was uh, um, Booker T. Washington had made fun of the like spectacle of a like poor black boy in a, in a you know rural. Uh, poor area somewhere sitting and trying to study a French grammar. And he's like, how's that going to help him? He needs to learn how to make bricks. <laughs> that was one of Washington's uh, like great achievements was you know training uh, black brick makers and sending them out and having, you know. So, um, so, and I mean, remember like Du Bois says, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm glad you taught people how to be brick made, but <laughs> nevertheless, the French grammar is really important. <laughs> um, so, right, so I mean, that, like that attitude is still here, but somehow like um, from within the veil, you can't maintain that. I think is what's going on. Um, so, um, right, and so in Souls of White Folk, I think this is the, probably the, the strongest, um, I mean, like, in some ways, Souls of White Folk is more against Europe than it is against America, right? I mean, I read those, those things about America, and it has very strong statements like that about America, but it's almost a footnote to the indictment of Europe in that essay. Right, and that, you know, um, like here maybe is the strongest thing he says about it on page 39. Um, As we saw the dead dimly through rifts of battle smoke and heard faintly the cursings and accusations of blood brothers, 
right? So the blood brothers are the Europeans who are fighting each other. They're really all the same. They're, they're, they're cursing and, you know, because they've just been blowing each other up. But he says, we darker men said, this is not Europe gone mad. This is not aberration nor insanity. This is Europe. This seeming terrible is the real soul of white culture, back of all cultures, stripped and visible today. Right, so, I mean, um, at this point, he's saying, uh, there isn't anything to be saved in Europe, and there never was. This is the real Europe, is like um, um, fighting and killing each other. <laughs> and we only didn't notice it before because they were doing it in Africa instead of doing it to each other. <laughs> right? But um, this, this is, right? He says, this is the real soul of white culture. This is the truth. Um, um, so So from that point of view, uh, it is, first of all, it is kind of a footnote, like America is kind of a footnote. It's, um, you know, uh, um, and America is no better, I guess, is how you could put it, right? Um, um, getting a little bit, getting myself a little bit out of order here, or maybe I haven't really got myself into order. Um, but, um, but what I was going to say is, right, so so from that point of view, it might seem like, yeah, I guess, okay, this is how to, from that point of view, it might seem like the real thing that we've noticed is something new about Europe, right? Like before, um, I thought that Europe was this great place and, you know, that they, they didn't have race hatred there that we have in America. And uh, like now the wool has been pulled off my eyes and I can see Europe uh, for what it is. Um, and America is no better. Um, and so <clears throat> like, and if you look at it that way, it might be hard to explain what the veil has to do with it. Like what difference does that make? He's not even talking about America, he's talking about Europe. Um, but I think if you look more closely, um, so like, what is this thing that he's talking about when he talks about the soul of white? Um, like, who are these people who call themselves white? Um, so first of all, he says it's just recently been discovered. That even in the 18th century, people weren't thinking this way. Now, I don't know. It's, I mean, it depends who you read in the 18th century, but um, I don't know if that's completely accurate. But in any case, um, so he says, you know, he's saying even in the 18th century, people weren't thinking this way. It's a recent development. People have suddenly discovered that they're white. And um, um, 
And I think that if we analyze what he says this is about, it's um, you could see it as Europe claiming to be um, America. <laughs> um, so, like, um, how how can you, how can I make that out? Well. So I just start by this commentary he makes on, so he makes a big concession. We'll see uh, Coates also makes this same concession and has a similar comment afterwards. Whereas on the other hand, I think we'll see um, Via Cordova, uh, we're gonna read soon, who's writing from a Native American perspective, doesn't make a concession like this at all. But so um, this is the concession. It's on page 42. Such degrading of men by men is as old as mankind and the invention of no one race or people. Right? So in other words, after having said all the bad things that Europe and America are doing, he says, well, but there's actually nothing new about this. People have always done it. Um, and so you might say, well, okay, in that case, why are you complaining about it? Um, so I think he says three different things about that. The first is still there on page 42. Um, it has been left, however, to Europe and to modern days to discover the eternal worldwide mark of meanness, color. Um, now, I mean, does that assume that color was a mark that was there to be discovered? I think it doesn't, right? I think that that's sarcastic. It's, it was left to Europe to discover this amazing mark by what right, you're saying. So, People have always looked down on people other than themselves and tried to exploit them and conquer them and whatever, but it was left to Europe to discover this amazing way you can tell who is better and who is worse. Just look at their color, right? So, um, um, I think he's he's implying that you know this is just like newly invented. I mean, of course. Not all people have the same colored skin, but uh, um, for one thing, they come in a lot of different colors. Right? <laughs> I mean, uh, so uh, um, like the idea that this is um, this convenient mark you can use, just find the people who are quote unquote what, um, you know, they're not what. Right, like this. This is what. <laughs> no one is that color. <laughs> right. What color are they? Well, they're not all the same color. Right. So it's it's it's. I think he's implying that it's it's diluted. They diluted themselves into into thinking they discovered this amazing mark that they can use, and this mark is. Um, doesn't is supposed to not require any thought. It can perceive it. Right. So, and that's why it's like eternal and worldwide. It can, um, um, you can just decide in advance without uh, interacting with them, even who's going to, who's going to be uh, on top and who's going to be underneath. Um, So that, and I guess that's also part of what he's, I mean, I think, well, I don't know which is supposed to be a consequence of which, but when he says further on page 43, the imperial width of the thing, the heaven defying audacity makes its modern newness, right? That again, like this um, eternal and worldwide applicability, 
right? Like, I mean, because so, like, for example, if you distinguish between Greeks and barbarians, and then you, you know, and then you're conquered by the Roman Empire, well, you're kind of like, okay, they're not barbarians. <laughs> Um, uh, so it's, uh, um, those, but, like, I don't know whether this really could be worked out and applied to every past imperialistic civilization or whatever, but then at least it's, it's plausible what he's saying, what, what I think he's saying here that, you know, um, um, that, the older ways that people look down on other people and try to dominate them, whether we're always adjustable. Um, and they always, you know, like at least in theory, required understanding and familiarity. Whereas this one, because it's imagined to be this simple characteristic, uh, is uh, like automatically tries to extend itself everywhere at once and not have any flexibility to it. Um, so that's one way that, that even though this is this has always happened, this version of it is worse. But another thing he says, this is on page 35, so it's actually before the part I've been reading. Um, Here is a civilization that has boasted much. Neither Roman nor Arab, Greek nor Egyptian, Persian nor Mongol ever took himself and his own perfectness with such disconcerting seriousness as the modern white man. We whose shame, humiliation, and deep insult, his aggrandizements, aggrandizements, I guess, I don't know, so often involved, were never deceived. We looked at him clearly with world old eyes and saw simply a human thing, weak and pitiable and cruel, even as we are and were. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about in this paragraph. Um, um, one is the, the, I mean, I kind of, I guess, uh, already did this myself, but the inclusion of Rome and Greek and Greece in um, civilizations that are not in this way white. Um, I think he's actually he's pretty consi consistent about that in this essay. He sometimes I think, like I said, he really means that they couldn't be because whiteness hadn't been invented yet. Um, and I mean, it's it's certainly true that in the ancient world, so they did think about people being differing in color, but the, basically the organization was, there are the people in the South who are too dark and they're barbarians. And there are people in the North who are too light and they're barbarians. And then in between are the medium colored people like Romans, Greeks, Arabs, Persians, Indians, Berbers, whatever, right? And that's where the civilizations are. At least, I mean, that, 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 that's from a point of view of later antiquity, at least. So, you know, I mean, so I think it's true that the idea of what he's calling whiteness didn't occur to them. Um, but, uh, but he also, I think, wants to point out that the European civilization that he's thinking about in particular, and I think this is already a sign that this is really about America, that it really has no right to claim these people as white because it doesn't treat them as white. That is, when Italians or Greeks immigrate to America, um, they're, uh, right, what does he say? What is it about this? Um, this is on page 29. No, from my, from page 51, from my page 51.
says that America is at times heartily ashamed, even of the large number of, quote, new white people whom her democracy has admitted to place in power. Against this surging forward of Irish and German, of Russian Jew, Slav, and, quote, Dago, her social bars have not availed. But against Negro, she can and does take her unflinching and immovable stand. Right, so he's saying that like the Americans don't count uh, Italians and Greeks really as fully as white. Um, so from that point of view too, like uh, um, they're not, not really entitled to see this as part of their history. Okay, so anyway, that's, you know, that was just one thing I wanted to say about that paragraph, but, um, more importantly, is the thing about how um, none of these people took themselves in their own perfectness with such disconcerting seriousness as the modern white man. Um, now, I mean, and then again, he says, we always saw through them. Like, whether that's a good description of Du Bois's own earlier attitude or not, I'm not sure. But, but in any case, so we always saw through that. We knew that you were just human, right? So the, the idea here is that this, um, what's been invented here is a way of, like, thinking that you're not part of human history, that you're somehow above and beyond it. Um, and that's why he also says, this is on the next page, we know that we too have failed as you have and have rejected many a Buddha, even as you have denied Christ. But we acknowledge our human frailty, while you, claiming superhumanity, scoff endlessly at our shortcomings. Right, so the reason I say that this is Europe trying to be American, right, this understanding of what whiteness is, is that it's Europe trying to, like, rise above its own history and invent itself as, like, something that came out of nowhere and is not human like other people. Um, and that, you know, um, Europe trying to rise up above its own history and be nowhere and no one is America. So, like, I think that's why from inside America and with the veil in place, Du Bois, um, um, can only see Europe in this way. All he sees in Europe is um, people congratulating themselves on being white, and he says that means America. <laughs> um, uh, and um, and. From inside America, you can see that there's no such thing as being in that sense. Right? So again, it's like, I mean, we're, we're, we're coming back, but, but from a, I guess I would say, even more negative point of view to the things that Thoreau or Emerson say about the only true America. Um, that it's not here, that it's somewhere else. <laughs> right? It's like, like, this is, this was supposed to be the place, as Martin knew, said, that would show that all these things that people thought about human nature were not true. That people could rule themselves. Um, that they didn't need kings and, you know, whatever. Um, that they could rule themselves based on principles. Universal principles that would apply anywhere. Um, that weren't just their own traditions. Um, and uh, and yet um, being 
black in America uh, means uh, knowing by experience that that's not true. That's what he's saying. There is no such thing. Um, and, you know, when Martin knew, so of course Martin knew is well aware of the like um, problem that slavery causes for looking at America this way. But that's why she keeps saying, but, you know, we know abolition will soon triumph. Um, uh, so, I mean, leaving aside the fact that it took a lot longer and was a lot harder than, than she thought, right? I mean, the, the um, Du Bois is writing from after that happened, and this is what's still happening here. So that didn't solve a problem. I mean, um, I think we'll see something similar in Coates with the, the, the kind of the civil rights movement that, you know, that because Du Bois, when he's more in his more optimistic moods, will say, like, you know, we hope someday this segregation and whatever will end and we'll be treated like normal citizens. But then that happened and we still didn't happen, <laughs> I think is Coates' point of view. But in any case, so getting back to Du Bois, so like, um, that's what it looks like from inside the veil. And so from inside the veil, it looks like um, Europe's attempt to transcend itself has um, um, the only effect it's had is that people people are just as bad as ever, but now they are deluded into thinking that um, that they're not that they're above all. Um, so, so there's like, so there's two different, um, perspectives that are, uh, um, that can't be reconciled with each other because you know, when he's in France, um, he feels like um, he's in the worthiest nation on earth. <laughs> um, and he's proud that France has been has been saved in part by the efforts of these black soldiers. Um, so, uh, and, and now they're proudly playing in the town square and everyone's coming to look at them or whatever, right? So, um, um, but uh, when he gets back to America, he, he looks back at Europe from over there and he says, well, that's, you know, that's just an illusion. Um, so which is the, which is the true way to look at? Yes, is the question, right? Like, is it, you know, is the is the view from America the view that's distorted by the veil, where like, you know, when you sail into New York Harbor, you see the beauty of nature. It's here just as much as anywhere else. Um, but then, like, suddenly the veil drops, and you can't see things that way. Instead of beauty, you see ugliness. Um, is 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 it that, or is it the view from within the veil? Is the view from of people who uh, have been stripped of their illusion, and they can see what's really going on? So that's actually, I think, is the question he's talking about at the beginning of the essay of beauty and death. Um, this is on page 
Um, for long years, we have the world gone wild. Right, so the world gone wild is a, is a reference to the world war again, I think. For long years, we of the world gone wild have looked into the face of death and smiled. Through all our bitter tears, we knew how beautiful it was to die for that which our souls called sufficient. And then skipping a bit of this, he says, um, Um, and we asked in a half whisper, this death, is this life? And is its beauty real or false? Of this heart questioning I am writing. Right, that's, I think that question, you know, that question, which is hard to understand. <laughs> but I, I, I hope by, by talking about this for all this time, I've, I've made it somewhat easier to understand what the question is. Um, you know, he doesn't, he, he um, must be, have a good reason for this. For, for putting it in this opaque way. Um, he, does, right, he doesn't start writing an essay saying, you know, uh, which is the right way to look at Europe? <laughs> Is it good or bad? Is France something that's worth saving or is it not, you know, et cetera. But he puts it in this much more abstract and difficult to understand way. Yet I think that's the question he's asking. Is its beauty real or false? The beauty is the beauty. Remember, he said when he was in Montego Bay, he said, it is from such heights of holiness that men go out to, to uh, master the world. And then he starts talking about the call to service in the war. So, like, the question is, um, you know, is is the point of view of beauty from which this sacrifice looks, um, this death looks like life? Um, and and so you can look into the face of death and smile. Is that real or is it false? And is the reality um, that uh, if you die, it will just be because some greedy people want to divide up after you? Um, So that's what he's asking, but I don't think he gives a straightforward answer to that. Now, what I mean by that is, I don't think, I, I don't mean that he like hedges it or something. I think he he switches the point of view from which to ask the question. And this is the thing he talks about at the end, which is very hard to understand. But um, this thing about beauty demanding an end, Right, so um, this is on the bottom of page 246. There is something in the nature of beauty that demands an end. Ugliness may be indefinite. It may trail off into gray endlessness, but beauty must be complete. Whether it be a field of poppies or a great life, it must end. And the end is part and triumph of the beauty. Um, and uh, there's like, three paragraphs about this, and then the last one ends. No, no, I'll read this part. So the ugliness of continual births fulfills itself and conquers gloriously only in the beautiful end, death. Think so. There's two different things he's thinking of when he thinks of the end. 
Um, one is uh, like that scene of coming back to New York. And at first it looks beautiful, but it doesn't last. The veil drops and it comes to an end. Um, and of course, the other thing he's th thinking about is death, death and battle. I mean, that's what, I, I mean, I guess death and battle is what he means. I guess. And that's not clear at all. But, I mean, he's talking about that at the beginning of the essay, for sure. We smile, you know, we, uh, we smile in the face of death, but whatever. Um, um, it's so it's at least one of the one of the meanings of end that he's thinking of here, and he's saying like, um, um, it's essential to the so like rather than asking is the beauty true or false, he's saying. Um, like, can that beautiful point of view, um, or I guess I it this way, he's saying, um, that it seems false because it can't last because it's always disappointed and when it's disappointed it always as in the souls of white folk it's always it's not just that things were beautiful and now they're not right it's that they never were you learn that they never were there were no great principles on which America was founded. Um, so, uh, you know, there was no beautiful country of plants. Um, uh, and so you say, so therefore that, that beautiful perspective was false. It couldn't maintain it. Couldn't maintain itself, even, like it, again, not just it couldn't maintain itself, like it couldn't keep experiencing beauty, but the you, the things that seemed beauty couldn't beautiful couldn't keep seeming beautiful. Um, um, and you know, so it, and it's I think when you look back at the structure of the whole essay, it's. Um, it's like that last time when the veil drops is the most dramatic, but I think that alternating between the description of and what he says, you know, when he starts doing this, he says, I'm not going to talk about um, the greatest beauties. Um, of like friendship and love and whatever. This, you know, uh, and I'm not going to talk about the greatest ugliness in you, right? I'm not going to talk about like murder or lynching, whatever. I'm going to compare the lesser beauty, and the lesser beauty is the beauty of nature, right? So, um, so like all those descriptions of the beauty of nature are, um, I mean, it's exactly what Jonathan Edwards called secondary beauty. Right, like beauty of order and proportion and whatever. You know, I mean, I don't know if if Du Bois would, would analyze it exactly the same way, probably not. Right. Like, I mean, Jonathan Edwards, it seems like according to him, like, you know, something like this would be particularly beautiful because of order, you know, right? So like uh, I think Du Bois obviously as an artist has a more I guess you could call Jonathan Edwards an artist too, not the stuff we read. So. Well, I don't know. Anyway, Du Bois maybe has a more subtle understanding of that, but nevertheless, he's, you know, this is secondary beauty, saying it's not true beauty. True beauty is virtue. <laughs> right? So, uh, 
Um, so, but so that's kind of a stand-in. Those things, those descriptions of nature, are kind of a stand-in for the um, like believing in the beauty of universal principles, principles of universal benevolence, um, and um, and what's represented in that alternation is that you can't hold it. Doesn't last. Um, but then what he's saying at the end is, but that's not a sign that it's not true because that's the way beauty is. Right? And this, of course, is not like Jonathan Edwards. Um, um, this is something I think you know you can only say after all the things that have happened in between um that uh, um, the nature of true beauty is 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 not to be able to maintain itself because that end is um is actually which which you take to be like which seems to you to be kind of a dissolving of it and realizing that it never existed is actually the sign of its completeness. Um, so. Um, Right, so whereas ugliness is um, ugliness is never comes to an end, and you and again the way that seems to you is so that must be true. That's the point of view that can maintain itself. Um, but he says, no, that's actually the sign that it's um, um, ugliness has a project that can't in principle be completed. And that's why it's never disappointed. It never finds that uh, um, it never has that experience of uh, I believed in this, and now it's abandoned me, and I'm disappointed. Right? So, ugliness to me is eternal, not in the essence, but in its incompleteness. But its eternity does not daunt me, for its eternal unfulfillment is a cause of joy. There is in it nothing new or unexpected. It is the old evil stretching out and ever seeking the end it cannot find. It is the uh, it may coil and writhe and recur in endless battles, days without end, but it is the same human ill and bitter hurt. Right. So, like, I think you know this is an echo of what he said at the at um, in the souls of white folk about. Um, uh, men have always done this to each other. There's nothing new in this. And so in the, in the souls of white folk, that's the sign that now you've seen through to the reality, right? Because you've seen the, um, that it's really just the same old thing. That, that uh, Europe hasn't transcended itself um, that uh, and therefore there's no such place as America. Um, um, the, again, the sign that you've seen through is that you see that it's still the same human uh, ill and bitter hurt. But then he continues, but beauty is fulfillment. It satisfies. It is always new and strange. It is the reasonable thing. That so that like that statement seems out of place in this 
experience, right? It is always, it, it is fulfilled, it is satisfied, it, you know, uh, it is always new and strange. And then it is the reasonable thing. So, we, I mean, he's talking about the law of reason, I think. The law, the law of reason is uh, is true beauty. It is the reasonable thing, but its end is death. The sweet silence of perfection, the calm and balance of other music, therein is the triumph of beauty. So it's, I mean, um, this is a pretty deep philosophical point. I, I don't, I don't know if I'm doing it justice. Uh, I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing Schelling might say. Um, uh, but, um, but I, I think number one, it's the answer to the question, which of these perspectives is true? And the answer is, well, um, they're they're both true because um, when you look at the ugliness in the world, it's true. It's always the same ugliness, seeking the same ugly ends. And, and when you look at it from that point of view, you say, um, there can't be a true America. Um, and it's true from that point of view. It is true that it's always the same argument, seeking the same argument. But on the other hand, we take that other point of view and you say, nevertheless, now I'm taking this point of view of beauty. And I know it won't last, but it's essential to it not to last. Um, that's the sign that it's that it's a it's a form of true perfection. And you know, from that point of view, um, it's uh, the other point of view is just. Um, well, he actually calls it cowardice earlier in the essay. Right? He says pessimism is cowardice. Cowardice means you're not willing to go forth and meet your death. Um, so, right? He's sort of saying, and that point of view is also true. And, um, um, I think there's a kind of, it's not like, it's not an attempt at a stable solution like we saw in Royce, right? Like in, 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 in Royce, there's, um, and in Adams too, I think, uh, there's a sense that, um, we can reconcile the particular and imperfect nature of America with the idea that America is supposed to stand for universal principles. We can reconcile it in a, in a kind of stable way because we show that particularity is necessary for individual freedom or something like that. So, I mean, Du Bois is not like attacking that problem from that point of view at all. Um, but he is attacking a problem that's like that or related to that, I think, right? I mean, because again, it's the question of um, whether uh, when you think of America as something new in history, something new and strange, not the same old enemies, whether that's just self-delusion, because um, um, uh, it's got to be somewhere. 
<laughs> and it has to have some history. And when you look at that history, you'll see the same old human arguments. Um, so, um, and so the answer is, um, you can look at it that way, and you won't be wrong if you look at it that way, but you'll be cowardly. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's all I have to say about it. Uh, I will see you next time. Really, it's going to be completely, something completely different. <laughs> all right.